there's the you know, possibility that with our thinking, we produce more distinctions, more differences with others. And yet the Apostle Paul has this charge to think the same thing. Several times in Philippians and Corinthians, he encourages them towards unity to, to think the same thing. How do you guys understand those passages and uh, how does the life of the mind relate to greater unity rather than only greater diversity in the church? You're absolutely right that um, a devotion to doctrine and especially thinking hard about doctrine causes one to um, define it, and as soon as you define, it's not this. Mm -hmm. It's this and not this. And the not this believers are now not believing what you believe and their tensions. And the more important the issue is, the greater the tensions, and, and none of us likes that kind of tension. And the first thing I would say exegetically is that word group tends not to be the not at o word group, but the front at o word group, okay? I'm sure that means a lot to everybody. He was not a scholar there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the command to, to be minded a certain way and to think a certain way, now I could be wrong, there could be exceptions to this, but just in general, those, those commands are a, a word group in Greek that's very difficult to bring over into English. It, um, it would be, attitude would be as good a translation as think. Have the same attitude. Same, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Um, doesn't mean in that case, even though it should be, that we're thinking his thoughts about biology or thoughts about the cross. It means he emptied himself, took the form of a servant. Have a servant mind. And so usually the call to have one mind is to the call to have one orientation on, on humbling yourself to be a servant. That does not answer the problem. It's only toward it. The, the apostle really does want us to think the same thoughts doctrinally. <laughs> He's not into, well, to have a couple of views about the cross. The more the better. That's, that's not the way Paul would think at all. He would like there to be one pervasive understanding of the atonement in this room and around the world. And so the command, I think, means work at it. And, and the way to work at that is not to say it doesn't matter, for goodness sakes. So if the command comes, have the same mind or think the same, then what would you do? Well, you'd preach and you'd write as persuasively as you can and as kindly and as winsomely and as lovingly as you can. And when there's a pocket in your church that's forming a little click, getting a little different view about something, you wouldn't take angular pot shots at them from the pulpit, you call them up, right? Say, can I come meet with your group and say, tell me what you're thinking, where did this come from? I, can I, this doesn't look right to me, and there would be a, an effort. So the whole reconciliation, you know, lo love your enemy and be slow to anger and be quick to listen, all those things that we usually think of only in terms of relational dynamics, they're all intellectual dynamics as well. And we would do better probably in the uh, evangelical world if there were more phone calls, wouldn't we? Fewer blogs, more phone calls. Now, I'm not one of those who says you can't criticize somebody publicly until you've called them on the phone. I think that's not true if they've been public in espousing an error. But there are a lot of cases when you can. There are a lot of cases when you can. And we, we might go a long way to rectifying. I, I write more letters to the editor with a note at the top, this is not for publication, than I do, this is for publication. That's why you don't see any letters from me. I just gave up on writing letters to editors, but I still write when I'm steaming about something to a, an editor and says, I, look, I'm just ticked at what you did. I don't want the world to know that. I just want you to know that, okay? Why in the world would you publish such an article or some, something like that? And maybe that's not the best tone, <laughs> but I'm a sinner and so, 
I, I think the two responses I have are, one, those verbs are generally attitudinal, but uh, we should work towards thinking the same about doctrinal issues, and the best way is to teach and preach and speak in winsome, loving, compelling ways. The point I want to make, the first thing I want to say is that what, what John just did for us, what you just modeled there is actually thinking about thinking in, in a way that acknowledges what you just did was you said, look, that, that's just something thrown at me, but in order to understand it, we're going to go back to the text and understand it's not quite so simple as you just presented it, which is, it was great the way that you, you, you set that up and, 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 and laid it out. And I think you're exactly right. We're the, pe- we're the truth people. We can't act like truth doesn't matter. And, and the more you talk about truth, the greater the risk is you're going to disagree or, or, or you're going to find that there's a miscommunication or, or you're going to have to work things out. That's the price we're going to have to pay till Jesus comes because the price of not doing that is turning ourselves into a non-thinking, non-theological, non-doctrinal people who will lose the gospel. So we, we've got to be unapologetic about that, but it's going to humble us. It's going to humble us. It's going to humble us for a number of reasons. It's because in the give and take of this conversation in the believing church, I don't mean with unbelievers, and I don't mean with, with liberal theologians and skeptics and all the rest. But as we talk to each other, we're going to find ourselves in error. Uh, uh, we're going to need a lot of Priscilla's and Aquila's to take a lot of Apollos' aside and say, that wasn't right. And I had to preach a message in chapel. I just felt very much on my heart from that text this semester to my students to tell them, I want to take you back to a certain point when I was in error and I desperately needed Priscilla and Aquila to show up and correct me. Turned out, don't get into a gender bending thing here. His name was Carl Henry, but nonetheless, so it was not Priscilla, but it was Aquila who showed up in this case to fulfill that function. And, and I, needed, I needed that correction. It's, meant, it's happened times I'm not even aware of where I've been corrected by the preaching of God's Word in a way that's sometimes not even, not even here. We, we've got to risk disagreement. Disagreement's not the worst thing. Disagreement's the price you pay to make sure you actually know what you're talking about and, and, and clarify. And, and you, can, you can be in a disagreement and love each other all the more for it. Uh, I have Christian brothers who will challenge me and whom I challenge, and at the end of it, we worship God more faithfully together because of this. And, and you, need to, you need to do a couple other things. You need to think in, in out loud. One of the gifts we need to give each other is to expose our thinking to each other. We tend in our intellectual narcissism, and I'm as guilty as this as anyone else, to want to show up with a finished product, okay? Mm. Here is the truth. Here's my position. I have arrived here. We need to be vulnerable because we'll be far more faithful if we will line out our thinking so that we can, we can watch each other think, hear each other think, and go, okay, you know, if that's not tightened back here, you're going to end up over here. Or I don't think you heard what you said when you were, when you were there. So we need to do that. In, in that beautiful uh, booklet for the conference you were given, the article that is under my name is on theological triage. And the last thing I want to say is that's just an offering for this discussion. I didn't know it was coming up. I didn't know the question was coming. But we have to have the maturity and the discernment to say there's some things we have to be united on or we can't recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, so, someone asked me a question one time, what do you say to someone, a believer, I was told, who doesn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ? Here's what you are. You're not a believer. Okay? <laughs> we have a category problem here. You know, there are certain things that have to be believed. And this is a New Testament issue. When the apostles had to say, here's what the gospel is, you have to know this much. Romans 10, for example, I mean, you have a very clear example. If, if you're not there, you're not a believer. You're not a Christian. You're, 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 you, you are, you're, not, you're not inside. You're still outside. Why don't you get inside? There's a second level, I suggest, in which we have some serious disagreements. And it's not because we don't love the Lord and we don't love the Bible and we don't want to serve Jesus, but there are issues that divide us denominationally that aren't accidents. They go back to serious disagreements about things that matter, and we love the Lord, and we love the truth enough to know they really matter. We might both be wrong, but we can't both be right. But we, but we do recognize each other as sincere believers in Christ, and we can witness together. Whitfield and Wesley could share the gospel together and preach together and be involved in ministry together. We can be in this room together. We can exult in Christ together. And we know that the commonalities that bring us here are why we're here, but we're still who we are when we walk in the door. We didn't become desiring God robots. We are who we are, and until Jesus comes, we're going to have to work with some things. And in humility, there are going to be some things we're going to disagree with until our Lord teacher corrects his church and purifies and sanctifies his church in common. 
But then there's a third category, and, and this is important for us too. There are things we disagree about that don't matter to the preaching and teaching of the gospel or the right ordering of the church. There, there may be as many positions on some questions of eschatology as there are people in this room, and I can live with that. So long as we're absolutely certain of the coming visible triumphant return of the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse and claim his church and the consummation of all things according to everything that Scripture proclaims, there could be all kinds of different positions on how the human soul originates and, and this or that and different interpretations of things that don't matter. And we recognize that. In humility, we need to recognize that's just another sense of our fallenness. That's just another sign of our incomplete sanctification, Okay. But it isn't going to matter. We can still worship together and work together, and we can agree on the ordering of the church on these things together. So that requires some maturity. If you make a third-order issue a first-order issue, you're going to blow the place up. If you make a first-order issue a third-order issue, you're going to flush the gospel. It just requires some maturity in growing up here. And we got to do it together, so think out loud.